Hey there, language lovers. I'm Shannon Kennedy, co-host of the Language Hacking Podcast, along with Benny Lewis. And in this episode of the podcast, we are chatting with Alex Rawlings, Britain's most multilingual student in 2012, author of How to Speak Any Language Fluently, and language journalist. In this episode, we discuss how a polyglot keeps their languages active and prioritizes what to work on, dealing with dual identities as someone who's bicultural, taking language learning from hobby to career, strategies for reviving a language you have studied in the past, why you should adopt the philosophy of being a non-perfectionist, learning strategies for advanced language learners, and finding your voice in another language. If you enjoy this episode of the podcast or the Language Hacking Podcast in general, we would love to hear from you. You can leave us a review at languagehacking.com slash review. And now let's jump into our chat with Alex. The links and resources mentioned in this episode can be found at languagehacking.com forward slash 49. Welcome to the Language Hacking Podcast from Fluent in Three Months. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the Language Hacking Podcast. I'm joined as always with my co-host, Shannon. And today we have a guest that I'm very pleased to be talking to. This is Alex Rawlings. So Alex is a very big member of the language learning community in terms of uh, he has helped with the initial Polyglot conference when that kicked off. And he's been um, a big face in the community for a lot of events. And we would have first heard of him from uh, getting the title of the, um, am I getting this right, Alex? The most multilingual student in Britain. Is that the title you had? Yes, but it was in 2012. So yeah, yeah, I'm a long bit, time I'm a bit, ago. I'm a bit, you know, because it's soon going to be 10 years ago. So it's, it's saying, yeah. you know, Britain's most multilingual student 2012 sounds a bit like saying Britain's most multilingual student 1982 these days. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm trying right. to think of a new title. Well, you, you're definitely doing a lot of interesting things, so I want to get to that. But just kicking things off, let's uh, let's go back to the before four times and let's hear about how did you become the most multilingual student uh, in the UK and how did you get into languages in the first place? Um, well, the multilingual student thing was, was basically because um, I wanted an iPad and um, that was the prize. Uh, but, um, how we got to that stage, I mean, it was, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a bit of a longer story. I mean, so I grew up in London in the UK and, um, I was very lucky, I think, to grow up in a bilingual household. So my mum was always speaking Greek to me and I was also getting English everywhere. Um, and I had a lot of friends who basically were like kids who were bilingual or multilingual from the beginning. So, you know, for some reason they were just able to open their mouths and speak more than one language. And that wasn't my case. I could kind of understand quite a bit of Greek, but I couldn't really speak it for a very long time. And I didn't really want to speak it. I kind of thought it was a bit of a weird game that my mum was playing, basically. Um, so that went on for a while. And then, you know, my mum was kind of getting very frustrated because she wanted me to speak Greek because it's her, you know her mother tongue and she wanted me to be able to connect with that side of the family. Uh, so one day when I was eight, she had the wonderful idea of taking me on holiday to Greece uh, and basically taking me to a place where uh, I was completely surrounded by the language and completely surrounded by people my age that I could have spent an amazing summer with, but I couldn't speak to them because we didn't share a language. Because, you know, that age of eight is quite a critical age, I think, because it's just before a lot of countries start learning English. So I couldn't really rely on that. And, you know, maybe if we'd gone aged 14, I would have come back from that trip with a story of, oh, the whole world speaks English. There's no point in learning languages. But I think because I was eight, I really had to make an effort. So basically I was faced with this very difficult choice of spend a whole summer with my mum being very bored or try and speak a bit of Greek and go make some friends. So I did the latter. Uh, and by the end of that summer, the Greek was just flowing. It was just coming out, you know, because I just spent the whole time just speaking that language. So that's when I kind of realized that languages were not just this weird game. Languages were actually kind of this way to connect with people around the world and to be able to give yourself more opportunities and to be able to make friends with people that, you know, maybe you have a lot in common with and that you you want in your lives as a positive presence, but you can't because you don't share a language, you know? So that's, it suddenly clicked in that moment. And ever since then I've been hooked. I think I started learning languages um, as a kind of, let's say, strange hobby 
when I was 14. That's when it really started uh, because I remember we went to Amsterdam uh, once and I remember just getting on the plane and hearing the sounds of Dutch in the security announcement. And I just thought, oh my God, what is this language? Like, I need to learn it. It sounds so weird. Like, how can this, this be a real thing? So ever since then, I was just teaching myself languages. So Dutch led to Afrikaans. Russian at some point a little bit. Um, I started teaching myself Spanish, then joined the class at school. Um, I just really couldn't get enough. And then basically this all led to me studying German and Russian at university because uh, I really wanted to to study Russian properly because I kind of got the impression after a few attempts that it was a language that you couldn't just kind of pick up. It was a language that required quite a lot of dedication. So I thought, okay, I can do it at university. And that meant that I had to spend a year in Russia. And then when I was basically researching for that year in Russia and looking for some information. I was on a website called thirdyearabroad.com where I saw an advert that said, are you Britain's most multilingual student? It's because if you are, you could win an iPad. So I thought, brilliant. So <laughs> that was basically how that came along. And then um, there was lovely people at HarperCollins, so I believe you know Benny. Uh, they set up this whole, um, basically this, this 11 language interview in about an hour and a half with native speakers from 11 different countries. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever had to speak every language you've ever learned or every language you've ever dabbled in, in an hour and a half, but it's quite an exhausting thing. Uh, and it's, it's certainly something I'd never had to do before. And it's never something I've ever had to do since. So in a way it was a bit of an artificial exercise because, you know, polyglots, people who learn languages, we, I don't think we just learn them so we can list them off. We learn them so we can use them and kind of have meaningful conversations and, and, and things like that. But just kind of speaking a bit like a robot was a bit, was, it was a bit overwhelming, but it went well. And at the end, they said I was Britain's most multilingual student. Um, when I went to collect the prize, there was a journalist there from the BBC. We then spent four hours in a park in minus one degrees, minus one Celsius, uh, filming this two and a half minute video where I spoke all my languages. And I woke up the next day and checked my brand new iPod, sorry, my brand new iPad. And uh, it was blowing up because the video had gone viral. Uh and the rest is history. So, <laughs> so there's a very long answer to your very simple question. So you listed off a bunch of different languages and based on how your interview went, it seems like you keep many of those languages active. And I think one of the things that a lot of polyglots do is they kind of go through phases of having certain languages active and certain languages not active. So how do you keep your languages active and how do you decide which ones you're going to kind of prioritize in that moment? Well, I think the key really is in the choice of language in the first place. Like I don't learn random languages. I've always been quite clear about that. I learn languages that I know I'm going to need and that I know that I'm going to be able to use. Uh, so for example, I learn languages where I have friends from that country or where I'm going to travel there, or I've lived in the place, or I have work reasons to know that language, you know, or just kind of a real interest and passion for that place and the culture and the people and the history and all that kind of thing. So I really find that like when when you choose those languages, it's, it doesn't feel like such a chore to keep those languages up because they just become kind of a natural part of your life. They become a natural part of your routine to speak those languages and to, to practice them. Having said that, it's not like I practice all of them all of the time. And I definitely have phases where certain languages sort of retreat a bit and other languages come forward um, in terms of use, but I've never felt, I've never had the sensation of losing a language. I've never felt like I've lost the ability to speak a language. I always feel like it's there somewhere. Maybe it just needs a bit of defrosting. So I'm curious about how you feel about yourself, your sense of identity, because I think you're an excellent representative of the, uh, of Europe's multilingualism. And you're one of multiple British polyglots that I know. But of course, it's been a heartbreaking experience in recent years of Brexit happening and that, um, you know, we've, we've had to deal with that. And that has kind of conflicted with Britain's identity, uh, within Europe and obviously within the European Union. And I know you've got a uh, dual citizenship. You've also got a Greek passport and you've spent a lot of time living in other European countries. So how do you deal with that duality of like, uh, like embracing your British heritage while also seeing that there is that little conflict with embracing other cultures as a, as a UK citizen? Well, I don't know if I do deal with it. <laughs> I think um, it's kind of a constant thing. It is it's, it is a constant kind of struggle. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the, the whole, the, the political thing of leaving the European Union is is one thing. I mean, I think that's, it's easy to talk about that because it's a very clear event that happened. But I think before that happened, there were a lot of things going on in the UK anyway, 
that meant the country was going on in, in that direction. And certainly, um, I think maybe one of the reasons why I was so drawn to languages and why, I mean, a, a, a lot of multilingual people that I know tend to come from the UK, actually, which is very bizarre, is that we have a very negative attitude towards languages and towards multilingualism as a culture. Uh, languages are not obligatory in schools. Uh, and when they are obligatory in schools, um, the bar is very, very low in terms of what the education system expects people to be able to achieve in order to get a qualification. Um, and then even just, you know, anecdotally, I constantly have kind of family members, friends, people in my life saying, oh, why are you bothering to learn all these languages? There's no point. You know, everybody speaks English. Um and that's to talk about foreign languages. What we also forget when we talk about multilingualism in the UK is that the UK is itself a multilingual country. Uh, we have multiple indigenous languages in the UK, which have been there longer than English, uh, and which are similarly marginalized and similarly kind of ignored. Like, for example, um, I'd say the average person in England doesn't know a single word of Welsh. Uh, even though that's a language which is spoken by kind of a significant amount of the population is an indigenous language in the UK. So when you, when you kind of, when you're interested in languages, when you're interested in the world and you're interested in this particular perspective of the world where you don't want to just travel to be able to walk around everywhere speaking English and expecting everyone to reply to you in English, but you actually want to go and engage with it it's very hard to avoid kind of political tones to your life because ultimately being a British person who learns multiple languages and has a globalist view of the world fundamentally is a, a, a political position at the end of the day. Um, having said all of that, I mean, I was definitely inspired to learn multiple languages by my upbringing and by the fact that I grew up in such a multilingual environment and such a multicultural environment, which was London in the 2000s. Uh, and I remember very clearly feeling very proud actually of coming from a place where there were so many people from all over the world who all wanted to live there and who really felt like they could find their home there. And, you know, it was just amazing to be able to leave the house and go to school, go to work and just hear, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 different languages on the way to school, you know? So there is this other side of the UK as well. Um, this very accepting and very tolerant side. I think it's just that, um, it's, it's not an easy time at the moment for the UK. I've also, I've left the UK in, well, I left the UK in, at the end of 2018, so I haven't been there for a while. Um, so I'm not 100% sure how the atmosphere is there at the moment. With the pandemic, I haven't been able to go back for quite a long time, and I'm not sure when I will go back. Um, but I have put, I, I prefer to kind of keep the nice memories I've got of, um, of um, hearing languages there. And I don't necessarily want to think too much about how that situation might have changed, if it even has at all. I want to go back to something that you had mentioned earlier when you said that for you, language learning was kind of an odd hobby that you had, but you've obviously made it into something so much more than that now. And a lot of what you do today revolves around language learning. So how did you take uh, language learning as a hobby and turn it into a career? Well, I think I remember um, when in the UK, we choose um, our school subjects at quite a young age. We start specializing at the age of 13. Um, and there were a lot of discussions around that time of, um, oh, well, I should do this so that I can become this. I should do this so that I can become that. You know, it was all very kind of, um, it was a bit cynical, you know, the way a lot of people were thinking, you know, because I don't think you should be thinking that cynically when you're 13. You shouldn't be thinking, right, I want to be a brain surgeon, so I need to do this, this, and this, even if, you know, you don't enjoy it. And I was always sort of saying, well, I want to do the subjects at school that I enjoy most because that will lead me to something that I will enjoy the most as a career. And that was languages. And uh, what I realized uh, from a very early stage, actually, having made that choice, was that languages are a very unique um, subject at school and very unique thing in general, because learning languages doesn't limit you in any way. Speaking another language, whichever language it is, can only be an advantage in the world and whatever you want to do. Even if you do want to become a brain surgeon, being able to speak Spanish and Chinese and whatever else you learn can only be an advantage, you know? So it's the most, it's, 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 it's a huge advantage to be multilingual and to, to learn to be multilingual essentially, because it just broadens your, your perspectives, it broadens your horizons in a really kind of unique way. So um, I followed that path. And then um, 
I entered, well, basically a lot of opportunities arose directly as a result of languages. I went to work for a language learning company for a few years. Um, I've published a few books about languages. And the very first thing I did when I left university was I trained to become um, an English teacher. I didn't really like teaching English. So I don't think I know English well enough to teach it. Like the grammar and stuff is all a little bit hazy for me. So I basically started teaching other languages. I taught a lot of German and Russian and Greek and Spanish. Uh, and you know, the first few years of my career, I basically worked directly from languages, teaching them, writing about them, working for language learning companies. Um, and it was really great. But then I started to have this feeling of like, well, you know, it's, it's amazing to be thinking about languages all day. And it's amazing to be kind of, I mean, I'm very, very lucky to have a job where I can just, you know, think about the past tense, the future tense, comma mistakes, you know, it's, it's really, really nice to be doing that. But actually, I think I want to move to a next step, which is not just making my job about languages, but making what I do um, to be something that I can do with languages. And that's how I got into kind of um, journalism and particular documentary filmmaking and all that kind of thing. Because basically, um, I've always known that the best way to get a story from someone or to connect with someone is to get them to tell you that story in their language. And um, you can see it whenever you watch a documentary and someone is kind of speaking English because the documentary is in English. You know, there's, this is a little bit of a filter there sometimes because I know that I feel that when I speak languages that aren't my native language. But just giving someone the chance to tell their story in their language and then you taking their story word for word and working out how you explain it in English and subtitles or how you deal with it. It's a very different task. So that's been a very exciting thing that I've started doing the last few years. And I'm currently living in Barcelona, where basically everything that I'm dealing with is in Spanish um, or Catalan, or I think I once interviewed a Russian lady. Um, and it's been really, really amazing. It's a good way to kind of use your languages, but also feel like you're you're doing something a bit bigger than just teaching languages because you're also showing people what knowing languages uh, can allow you to, to do and where it can bring you. Absolutely. And you, when you, every, you try to have a travel experience, those languages just open things up completely. And um, one of your travel experiences I'm particularly curious about is uh, like, I, of course, have gone to countries and I've tried to learn their language. But it's generally I would be in countries that don't have prominent English spoken or English is definitely a second language. But you uh, you spent some time in South Africa and rather than using English the whole time, you were learning Afrikaans. So I'm, I'm curious, how did that um, how did that influence what your experience was in, in South Africa by learning it? Um, yeah, well, South Africa is a fascinating example because everyone makes the mistake of thinking it's an English speaking country. Um, whereas in reality, it's kind of a very small percentage of people that actually speak English as a first language there. I think it's around 5% of the country that actually speaks English as a first language. 95% doesn't. South Africa has 11 official languages and it has more than 11 languages that are actually spoken there, uh, which means that it is one of these amazing places where you kind of you walk out your door and you just hear different languages being spoken. And often you hear different languages being spoken by the same person, uh, which is amazing. If you, in, in a place like Johannesburg, if you speak less than four or five languages, you're basically excluded from society. You know, you don't get the jokes, you don't get the conversations going on around you, you know, so it's very, very interesting. So um, I spent a lot of time that, I mean, Afrikaans is a language that I actually started studying in London because I, you'd hear it all the time um, on the tube. Basically, there was always a lot of people speaking it. And it's not a particularly difficult language to learn if you speak German or you speak Dutch, or even if you speak English, there's a lot you can get out of it. Um, so I kind of arrived in South Africa with, with a fairly good knowledge of it. Um, but then my enthusiasm for it meant that people were very happy to speak it with me more and more and more. Um, and that got me to some very interesting places in the country. I've been to this kind of very bizarre <laughs> places in South Africa, um, which I think I wouldn't have got into just speaking English. Um, the other languages though, I mean, that I was really, really passionate about as well were languages like Zulu, Tosa, Sutu, and Swana. Uh, which I've heard a lot and which I can kind of basically make myself understood in enough to kind of make little jokes and things like that. But it's very, very difficult actually to learn those kinds of languages just because the, the, the materials are not as available as they are for languages like French or Portuguese or Italian. So, um, it's kind of an ongoing struggle, but those are the languages that I'd really love to learn. And the moment we're able to travel again, 
I'd love to go back and do something about that. So you, having learned 15 languages now, have likely established some pretty effective methods for learning new languages. And I know one of the things that you often talk about is extensive reading. Could you maybe go into a little bit more depth on what that is and how you use it? Yeah, I think the extensive reading thing really comes into play um, at a later stage of learning. You know, so it's when you kind of, let's say you complete kind of a basic course, you know, one of those introductory courses like Benny's course or the teach yourself course. Once you've done that, you need something to kind of keep you going. And that's when you can really start going out on your own. Uh, so, uh, for example, reading a book in a foreign language is a really, really rewarding, uh, experience, but it can also be quite humbling because you're basically immediately struck by the fact that you don't understand an awful lot of what you're reading which is normal. Uh, so basically what I would do is uh, I would choose, try to choose a book, which I think is going to be a bit easier to read. So not kind of a big classic like Dostoevsky or something like that, which is was famous for being difficult in terms of its language, even for native speakers, but maybe a book you already know, maybe a kind of a very recent book, maybe even a, a book, not necessarily a children's book, but like a young adult book or something like that. And just start reading. Uh, and don't put it down and just see what you can pick up. And then if you start to see basically words coming up again and again and again that you don't know, it's a good idea to look them up because they're probably quite important either for the story or for the language in general. Uh, another rule that I have is I never actually write in the book. I never write the, the, the translation uh, in the book because I like to go back and read after I've done some studying and be able to see how much more I understand. So I'd always keep a vocabulary list separate if I do go and look up words. Um, but the main thing really is just to open the book and read and try and enjoy it and enjoy as much as you can, understand as much as you can and pick up as much new vocabulary as you can and new expressions. And even if it's not new vocabulary, it might be a new phrasing or a new kind of um, idiom or expression that you might not have used naturally. Um, and, you know, when, when you're at that kind of intermediate heading to advanced level, that level of exposure to really good authentic language is invaluable. So you were saying earlier that you don't tend to lose your languages. And I mean, obviously, for the apart from the languages you'd have superficial contact with or brief contact with, I'm, I'm very curious to hear what your strategy is for being able to juggle the number of languages that you do. Because obviously you can do reading. And like you said, part of your work is that you're going to be potentially interviewing somebody. And Barcelona is a very multilingual city, so you'll have access to quite a lot of languages, but do you have a particular strategy or uh, a timetable and things that you like to do to be able to juggle multiple languages or do you just let them happen naturally? Like what's your process with that? Um, I sort of just let them happen naturally mainly. Um, but every now and then, for example, I'll think, okay, right. I need to improve my Portuguese cause I'm going to need it next week. So what do I do in that case? Uh, the first thing I do is try and increase my contact with the language. Uh, on a kind of very passive level. So that means listening to podcasts, um, watching stuff uh, on, you know, TV series or movies, whatever, uh, or maybe even just going back through my textbooks and reading things. And I think that the, the process of kind of like reheating a language as opposed to learning it from scratch is really one of spotting where your knowledge gaps are and spotting where kind of you've forgotten things or things are not coming as naturally. Um, Another thing that I think you can have if you learn a lot of languages in the same family is that one of those languages becomes the dominant language in the group. So in my case, that would be Spanish, which I'm using more than any other in the Romance family. So for example, if I'm going to go and warm up my Italian, I'm really going to be very, very aware of the fact that I'm likely to make a lot of mistakes that are coming from Spanish in Italian. I'd say things like, like for example, in Spanish, we don't use un in front of otro, we just say, you know, Otro, otra casa, otro día, something like that. But in Italian, of course, you do. You say un altro giorno and things like that. So you have to be very aware of those little pitfalls. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't think it's like a systematic approach to kind of juggling multiple languages because I tend to, I tend to just let it flow. And I find that the need to keep them going comes from a natural need for the language in the first place. Um, which if you choose the right languages for your life should be there, you know. When we were talking about extensive reading just a moment ago, you said it was an effective strategy for when you're kind of more at the intermediate phase. So what would you say are the strategies you like to use for when you're more at the beginner stage? Um, at the beginner stage, I kind of tend to put my faith basically into a course, you know, because I understand that it's it's an artificial way to learn a language. 
Um, and it, it may not be teaching me to speak in exactly the way that I want to be speaking, but I just have to let it happen and trust that it's going to work out in the end. So, um, I stick to those courses quite closely and just try and get through them and learn as much from them as I can until I get to the point where it's almost like a kind of instinct. It's just this feeling kind of comes on where you feel like suddenly you're able to start speaking about broader topics. You, you feel yourself being a bit more creative in the way you use the language, um, and, um, it just, it just, it starts to flow. I mean, I think you, the, when, when people go into learning languages, I think there's many things that you need to consider and there's many, um, attitudes you need to adopt. And one of them is an attitude of complete non-perfectionism. I really feel like if you're a, a perfectionist about your language learning, you are not going to get anywhere because the art of being multilingual, the art of speaking a language which isn't native is, is feeling comfortable expressing yourself, even though you might have limited resources to do it. So it's basically sounding good with what you've got. Uh, and uh, that's kind of my strategy, I think, for getting through those beginning stages as well. I just get comfortable with maybe sounding a bit silly, maybe saying things that don't really sound that good or, or sound that authentic. And I just kind of let go of that with the faith that one day it's going to work out and I'm going to be able to be me in that language um, one day down down the line. So yeah, that so I don't know that fully answers your question, Shannon. Um, but yeah, the strategy for the beginning would be to kind of stick to the cause, trust it, um, cross-reference stuff maybe as well with with maybe asking friends, you know, who speak the language, or they have to be careful because sometimes they don't always know the right things to tell you at the right moment. Um, and just, you know, getting through it, keeping up a good rhythm, pushing through those first three months or so when, you know, you really need to make quite a big investment in terms of effort and in terms of time. So you can get to a point where basically it feels like you're floating. Do you have a favorite course that you like to use? Just out of curiosity. I've really, honestly, I've used all of them. Um, I am not a huge fan of a lot of the courses that are available on apps uh, because I miss the oversight that you, and the perspective that you can get from just holding a book in your hands. You know, I mean, there's, there's something very, very powerful about being able to open a book and seeing where you're going which isn't always so obvious or as easy to see when you're, you're dealing with a huge algorithm of things. Um, so for me, the best approach are those, those courses, for example, the teach yourself courses, the Routledge colloquial courses, the Asimil courses that use this combination of kind of dialogues, vocabulary lists, grammar explanation and exercises with audio. Um, because I can just go over them again and again and again. And, um, that's been, that's been my kind of most reliable resource of learning languages um, all of this time. So we've talked about the beginning stage and the intermediate stage, but of course you have a level in these languages where you're not, you're not just having casual conversations, you're conducting complex interviews. And uh, like, as people would have heard, even from the brief amount that you've, uh, you've spoken in Spanish and uh, the word or two you said in Italian, you have a pretty good accent in these. So what does, how does your strategy tend to change in those advanced stages? How do you make sure you can keep it at the uh, mastery level in those languages? Well, I think the most exciting thing about the advanced stage is the advanced stage is where you really learn to be yourself in that language and you really start making choices. And it's not so much that you make mistakes all the time, although they still happen, but it's maybe you start saying things that other people wouldn't expect you to say, you know, so you often get negative feedback, someone saying, oh, I wouldn't say that, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. So the advanced stage is the most interesting bit, for, in my opinion, because that's when we start to make these choices. And one of the things that I like to do there is I basically find myself a native speaker role model. Uh, so that's someone who speaks the language as the first language um, and who has a kind of profile when they speak that language that I'd like to have, you know, so maybe they sound very educated, maybe they're like a nice person, so they make a lot of, you know, nice jokes and things like that. And I just really like the way they express themselves. I listen very carefully to how they express themselves and the words they use and, and the phrases, and then I start to adopt them. Uh, so that's happened to me when I moved to, to Barcelona, that's happened to me quite clearly with Spanish and with Catalan. Cause obviously I, I learned those languages at school. I learned them on my own. Um, I spent a bit of time in Spain before, but it was never quite the same as kind of being like, okay, I need to start a life here. So let's look around. Okay. 
these people are using the language in a way that I want to use it. So let's listen really carefully to what they do and let's pick up their mannerisms. And then you follow that for a bit. And then eventually you get to the point where you feel, okay, I don't actually need to be them anymore because through copying them for a while, I've learned to be myself. And um, I've learned how I want to use the language. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's all quite high level stuff. I don't know if that's making sense, but um, that that's kind of the thinking process behind it. Um, and th the advanced stage is really where you make a really big push for vocabulary, you know, because you're learning vocabulary that you don't actually need. You're just learning vocabulary that's nice to have and that maybe adds a bit of nuance, that adds a bit of a bit of, um, you know, a tone to what you're saying as opposed to just focusing on communicating. So you start learning all these kind of, you know, really fancy words, which I quite like. Like the other day I learned the Spanish word arasar, which I'd never learned, which can mean multiple things. One of the things it can mean is to bulldoze something, like to flatten something. Um, but uh, they can also use it in a metaphorical sense. So for example, la canción que arasó toda España is like the song which... Um, which flattened the whole of Spain because it was such a success. The song which basically like took over the whole of Spain. So words like that is kind of very exciting to learn. But then I have to remember to try and use them because <laughs> otherwise they just kind of sit here and you, you recognize them, but you don't actually directly feed them into your speaking. You've mentioned a few times now finding yourself in a language and using all of these different tools to kind of find your voice in each of the languages. And one of the things that you often hear is that in different languages, you have different personalities. So what is your thought on that? Like if you do have different personalities in different languages or what does it really mean to you to find yourself in a language? Yeah, I mean, I think... So the personalities in different language question is is a good one and it's, it's definitely a controversial one. Um, I think it's very difficult to say what a different personality in a different language would look like. I mean, does it mean you start behaving differently? Does it mean you start saying things you wouldn't say? Does it mean, I mean, just, just what would it actually look like if your personality actually changed when you spoke another language, you know? I mean, I remember once listening to London Greek radio uh, and then noticing that my driving was getting worse. Uh, but I think that's just kind of me being a bad driver as opposed to the Greek language entering my brain and taking over the steering wheel. Um, but having said all of that, it's definitely something that I've experienced. It's definitely a sensation that I've had at some points in my life where I've really felt like, um, oh, my personality is changing a little bit as a result of speaking this language. And then, so my theory about it really is this. I think uh, when you start learning a language, you're basically learning to speak in the way somebody else speaks. Uh, you're learning the language from your teacher, you're learning the language from your course, you're learning the language from the people around you, but whoever it is, it's not you, it's not coming from you, it's external. So in learning to speak like those people, you feel a little bit uncomfortable because you're using their language, which means that you feel like your personality is changing. And then maybe you also compensate for the fact that maybe you don't know a word properly or you, you, you don't feel very confident about grammar by kind of exaggerating certain... Um, traits that you might perceive to be from that culture. You know, I think it's very subconscious that this happens, but I think I've definitely felt it too. Um, that all happens until the point where you really start to feel like you can be yourself and that you really can express yourself with almost the precision that you can do in your native language. And then that feeling of personality shift goes down because there isn't a personality shift. It's your personality. It's just, it's coming out in that language. And it takes time to work out ways to express that. It takes out, it takes time to kind of work out ways to channel that, but you do get there. And then that kind of multiple personality feeling subsides in my experience. So I don't feel like my personality changes, particularly when I speak another language. I think it's just something that happens maybe as a result of an insecurity about the way that I'm speaking the language when I don't know something, or maybe it's just a perception, but you know, I'm me with everybody, with myself in every language that I speak. Getting back to what you're currently doing with the languages, I'd love to hear the, like, because like you said, it's, it's your passion now that rather than making your life about teaching languages, you're using these languages as a tool to open up all of these interesting stories. So can you give us a, a kind of a window into that life and what kind of stories have you discovered that you think uh, a monolingual English journalist would never have uh, come across. Yeah, well, I mean, um, for, I've got to say that with the current pandemic situation, it's not been easy to make a lot of progress on a lot of this stuff, as uh, you know, 
uh, not being able to meet people <laughs> or travel or do anything has been very, very tough for someone who likes to be out there in the world. Uh, but I was getting, making some really kind of good headway with, with some stories. I mean, one of the stories that I was doing was about, um, the village in Greece where I've been going my whole life, which is called Leonidio in the South. And in that village, there's basically a couple of hundred people who still speak this language called Zakonica which is the only surviving direct descendant of the language of the ancient Spartans. And um, it's it's a very interesting phenomenon for a lot of reasons, because basically nobody under the age of 60 really speaks it anymore for a number of reasons. A lot of people, even within Greece, don't appreciate the idea that it's something that's worth kind of getting passionate about or kind of trying to save or, or, or supporting through government means or anything like that. Um, but there's some really interesting stuff going on there because the last couple of years is uh, a a guy called uh, Panos Maneris who had left that area when he was much younger and then lived in the United States for a lot of years. He actually returned to Greece uh, and returned to that area about four or five years ago and to his horror discovered that nobody spoke his native language anymore. Uh, so he basically then has dedicated all of his time since then to trying to promote the language and trying to get it spoken again, uh, along with Eleni Manu, who's from the area and she's, uh, writing books and, and, you know, it's really, it's amazing to see how much of a difference two people can make. Cause it really is, you know, obviously they get a lot of support from other people, but the people who've really organized themselves, created, um, a presence on social media, created an organization and started doing things so much of it is them. And, um, it's just, I don't know. I'm, I found it very, very humbling really to think about, you know, the fact that these two people have basically taken on themselves, taken on the task for themselves of making sure that their language and their culture survives and is passed on to future generations and, you know, isn't just forgotten. Uh, so I was really, really lucky to be able to go in August out to Greece. I got to see my parents, which was very nice, but also I managed to spend a lot of time with them and they took me around and introduced me to all sorts of, uh, really interesting people in their eighties and nineties who only speak Sakonika and Greek. They didn't speak any other language. And they started to tell me these, these mad stories, um, about things that were happening. There's one lady who told me that um, during the military dictatorship in Greece, her husband was conscripted to the army and he would call her back and they would, uh, while he was away and, and they would speak on the phone in Sakonika. And then the, the military general told him, when you speak to your wife, you either have to speak in Greek or in English or you won't get any more phone calls. You know, this is absolutely mad <laughs> that you'd get told that because this is a Greek language. This is a direct language. The language is the direct descendant of the language of the ancient Spartans. Yet it was banned essentially for their conversations while he was in the Greek army. Um, so that's been very, very exciting to be able to do some of that stuff directly about language. Um, I've also just generally been doing kind of other projects here. I've been working with, um, a queer flamenco group here in Barcelona who are kind of trying to launch this new style of doing flamenco, which is not so focused on kind of gender normativity or heteronormativity, but really trying to bring a kind of queer LGBT aesthetic to something which is seen as very conservative um, and, and, and very kind of, you know, staple in, in Spanish culture. And, uh, most of one of, one of the, the guys who's in that group is actually from the UK, but speaks perfect Spanish with this beautiful Seville accent, which is always very interesting to listen to. But then there's also a guy from Chile and then the other guys are from Spain. So obviously the whole project there has been in Spanish. And I think they wouldn't feel comfortable speaking English or doing interviews in English. So, you know, it's been, it's been very, very humbling to be kind of part of their journey with them and just to be able to sit there. And, and sometimes I kind of wake up after spending like four days with them at a festival or something and think, wow, I'm only here because I can speak Spanish. I'm only able to work with these guys and gain their trust and get to know them because for some reason, when I was 15, I picked up a teach yourself Spanish book and kept going. One of the questions that we always make sure to ask our guests, given that this is the language hacking podcast, is what is language hacking to you? I think language hacking is thinking creatively about learning languages, but also thinking creatively about speaking languages. So uh, it's it's for me, when we talk about hacking languages, it's about unlearning maybe some of the negative lessons that we learn um, at school about languages, unlearning this idea of kind of perfectionism and we need to aim for 100%. But for me, when I feel like I've hacked a language, I feel like 
I found a way to be able to communicate what I want to say and understand what the person's saying back to me, however creative and however crazy that may be. And that feels like a success. And that feels ultimately like the goal. Because actually there's not a lot of rules about languages. There's, there's not a, it's very hard to cheat. Either you understand or you don't. Either you make yourself understood or you don't. That's literally it. Um, but getting to that point doesn't need to be as kind of stiff or as as formal um, as maybe early exposures to language learning make us think that it needs to be. Very good. And I'll make sure to put in the show notes links to your social media and any other projects you're working on. But um, just to wrap up, what is uh, what do you see as your future, both in language learning and in journalism, of course, when the world opens up again, what what are your dreams uh, over these next few years? Gosh, I mean, um, asking someone in a pandemic what their dreams are for the next few years feels like a very indulgent question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, look, I mean, it's been very interesting to be someone who's lived something of a nomadic lifestyle and lived in very many different places. Uh, I basically worked out that I've moved house at least once every year for the last 12 years. Um, and this, I mean, this year's really just taught me to sit still, you know, and to be happy with what I've got and to be happy with where I am. Uh, so, you know, when you ask me what my plans are, I'm literally thinking like, yeah, I'll put the sofa over there and I'll put that mirror up, you know, but I need to think bigger again. So that's a good question. Uh, in terms of languages, I'm really enjoying kind of continuing to get deeper and get more advanced, um, with the languages that I've got. So really kind of doing really, really well with them. Um, that's really, really exciting to me. That's not to say that I'm not going to dabble a little bit. I mean, there's, I've got all sorts of projects I'd love to learn. I've always wanted to really speak Turkish properly. I've always wanted to kind of learn something like Persian. And of course, languages like Zulu, Khosa and other languages in South Africa have always been so, so, so tempting. Um, but whichever language I end up doing, I really want to combine it with a project. So I really want to be able to say, okay, here's a film that I'm going to make. And in this film, I'm going to need this language. So let's bring it all together. So I still feel like there's an awful lot of stories out there in the world, um, that need to be told and that need to be told in the right way. Um, which in my opinion means that they need to be told in the languages of the people who've lived them. Uh, and once the world opens up and, you know, the opportunities start coming back to us, hopefully, um, I just really can't wait to get back out there and, 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 you know, start, start doing all that kinds of things. I'd really, you know, this topic of minority languages and endangered languages is something that the more I get into it, the more it kind of makes me feel very, very passionate. Um, so who knows? I'd love to go to Australia and, um, visit my friend Gilad Zuckerman, who is a language revivalist, bringing back Aboriginal languages from the dead and teaching them to the descendants of the people who spoke them, which is amazing stuff that's going on there. Uh, I'd love to get back out to, to South Africa and also other African countries and see the stuff that's going on there. Um, and yeah, just there's so much. We just have to be a bit patient. Of course. So like I said, I'll make sure people have links to your stuff and they can follow along when the time finally comes for you to be able to share all of those stories with us. Brilliant. Thanks, Benny and Shannon. So thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And um, until the next time, I'll wish everybody happy language learning. Happy language learning. Happy language learning. Take care, guys. All right. At the end of each episode, we like to share a tip that we kind of picked up in our chat with the guests. So these are things that are immediately actionable. So you can implement them in your own language learning, try something new, and then let us know how it goes in the comments for this episode of the podcast. So Benny, let's start with you. What was your takeaway with our chat? One thing I really uh, thought was fascinating was Alex's thoughts on having a different personality in each language. And it's certainly something that I felt. I felt that the way I've learned the language and the environment in which I've used the language has meant that, you know, for for instance, in Spanish, I'm more festive because I tended to go out a lot more. Whereas in French, I had a more formal French because I worked as an engineer in that language. And I like what Alex was saying that ultimately these are byproducts to the uh, specifics around how we learn the language and how we try to mimic those around us. But that ultimately our goal is to try to become ourselves in the language. And I've definitely found that as I've gotten better, even in the C mastery levels, 
that I have felt like myself. I have felt like I could use expressions and uh, had a sense of humor that's more like like me. And Alex has really emphasized that, uh, that this is kind of the the ultimate goal is to become yourself in the language and that the different personalities can be a path along that goal that you mimic those around you, but that becoming yourself is something that you can truly strive towards. So I really appreciated that. Yeah, I guess it's kind of along the lines of the expression, you're the combination of the four or five closest people to you. So the same would be true in your languages. Mm -hmm. And what about you? I think for me, it was the idea that he shared during his summary of what language hacking is to him. And that is this idea of unlearning. I feel like we spend a lot of time really focusing on what we want to learn and adding. And so there's just this emphasis on constantly adding. And sometimes I think we need to take a step back and consider what we need to take away, things that we need to unlearn. I know for me, there's a lot of things that I do, especially at the beginning when learning a language, which are great habits for quickly gaining ground in a language, but aren't so great habits in the long term when it comes to kind of hitting those intermediate and advanced stages. And so there are some things that I need to unlearn at those stages in my language learning to be able to get to that next level. Um, and just this idea of unlearning in general, these you know concepts that were taught to us in school or the strategies that we are taught for language learning in other situations that sometimes we need to reevaluate, assess, and perhaps even throw out. And so for me, it was definitely that. All right. As always, you can find all the resources and tips mentioned in the show notes for this podcast available to you in the description wherever you're listening. And once more, let us know what you think over at languagehacking.com slash review. And until the next time, happy language learning. Happy language learning. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Language Hacking Podcast. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you found this episode valuable and want to help us out, please leave a review at languagehacking.com forward slash review. The Language Hacking Podcast is presented by Benny Lewis and Shannon Kennedy and produced by David Sobel, with special thanks to the Fluent in Three Months team. The theme music was written and performed by Shannon Kennedy. Find the show notes at languagehacking.com forward slash podcast. Thanks for listening and happy language learning.